mother made. I will do that also. So he's here today no matter how many he's here. Praise the Lord. Scripture reading today. Scripture reading today is Matthew 22, 37 and 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then Psalms 9, 1 through 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So be it. Am I on? Okay. So, as we all know, we had Thanksgiving dinner last week. And, like always, our church turned out in force. I have no doubt in my mind that if we had to do it, our little church of 50 to however many we have could probably pull off the whole thing. So, thank you. I'm so thankful to be in a church that is so gracious and giving and loving. Throughout the, last, the course of the last two months, I've heard many reasons why people couldn't commit, though. Not from our church, from others. Some good reasons, some lame excuses, even some excuses that we, with our earthly wisdom, would deem good excuses. It got me thinking about priorities, and what our priorities, or rather our priority, should be, and it continued to weigh on my heart, so I felt called to preach on priorities this week. As I started looking into what the Bible says my priority should be, everything pointed to Jesus being the only priority I can really have. I found Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and that's where I'll be for most of the day if you want to turn there for reference. When we study Paul's letters, we see that each one has a theme. The theme of Colossians is the absolute supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus Christ as the head of all creation and the church. There is no other book that presents such a comprehensive picture of the fullness of Christ. First, a bit of background on Colossae, so you can get an idea as to why Paul wrote this letter. Biblical scholars believe that the Colossian church came into being during Paul's two-year ministry in Ephesus, because Acts 19.10 says, the, says, during that, says that during that time, all residents of Asia, which would include Colossae, heard the word of the Lord. The scriptures reveal that as Paul was preaching in Ephesus, two visitors from Colossae came to believe, Epaphras and Philemon. Philemon later hosted the Colossian church in his home, and Epaphras served as Paul's lieutenant in evangelizing the Lycus Valley. Thus, a new thriving church sprouted in Colossae, even though Paul had never been there. Paul, of course, had a deep interest in the church and prayerfully advised Epaphras and Philemon as necessary. So, natu so naturally, Epaphras went to Paul whenever a major problem arose. The problem came from false teachers who were propagating what is called Gnosticism. Gnostics considered themselves to be people of superior knowledge who could help lesser Christians attain deeper spirituality. The very word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which means to know. Gnostic literally means people in the know. Realize that I'm saying Gnostic and not agnostic. Gnosticism has taken a step aside as agno agnosticism has come into play in our world now. Many people claim to be agnostic, which literally means people who don't know. The Gnostics were the spiritual elite of the day. They had all the answers. Their basic doctrine was that matter, anything physical or created, was evil and that only the spirit was good. They reasoned that God could not be involved in creation because being perfect, he could not touch matter because it was evil. Therefore, the world came into being through a complicated surrogate process as God put forth thousands of emanations or lesser gods, each of which was a little more distant from him so that finally there was a little God so distant from God that it could touch matter and it created the world. 
Of course, this lesser God of creation was so far removed from the ultimate God that it too was evil. This reasoning led to the belief that Jesus Christ, if he was really the Son of God, could not have taken on a human body because matter is evil. This delusion spawned the Gnostic, Gnostic romances about Jesus being only a ghost like phantom. To the Gnostics, Jesus was not the creator, the incarnation was not real, and Jesus was not enough. The Gnostics built a system by which you could begin with Christ and work your way up the series of little gods until you reach God. In Colossae, the system consisted of ascetic disciplines, <laughs> like fasting almost to the point of death or beating yourself for your own sins, secret passwords, astrology, and some elements of Christianity. The Gnostics looked down on the Christians in Colossae and browbeat them and led them astray. That was the alarming message that Epaphras brought to Paul. Paul's response is the letter to the Colossians, in which he presents Christ as the creator and all-sufficient redeemer. Paul's masterful answer has served the church well through the centuries, as the church has repeatedly faced similar, similar heresies and is in fact today assaulted by false teachers and cultists who see Jesus as only part of the answer. In the first ten verses of Colossians, Paul greets and celebrates the church like he usually does in all the letters. Then in verse 15, he gets into the issue. Verse 15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. That God is invisible is a given in both the Old and New Testaments. In the Old Testament, we always see God as spirit. At times, God reveals himself through theophanies, a visible manifestation to mankind of God. God revealed himself through a fiery bush, a cloud, even a man, but these images never fully depicted God. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Jesus is the revelation of God, what God is really like. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The Greek word for image is icon, E-I-K-O-N. It's where we get our word icon, which means an image or representation. The word icon is sometimes translated to picture. From that usage, we see that Jesus is literally a self-portrait of God. However, Jesus goes even further than being just a picture or image of God. Jesus also reveals the personal character of God. Jesus is not a second-rate emanation from the true God or a rung in the Gnostic ladder to the true God. Je Jesus is literally the exegesis, the explanation, the interpretation of God. Through Jesus, we don't just get a glimpse of God, we get the full embodiment of God, because Jesus was God. Man has always longed to see God. Man's longing to see God was fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus was the perfect visible image of the invisible God. Next verse, or next part of that same verse. The firstborn of all, over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. When I think firstborn, I think Kira. She's my firstborn. But that is not what this verse is talking about. Firstborn in the Bible is often a term for rank. The firstborn child was often the first in rank or honor. So when Paul calls Jesus the firstborn of creation, he is saying the highest honor belongs to him. The Greek word used here is prototokos, which is where we get our word prototype. A prototype is a model after which all the others are modeled after. Jesus was the prototype for all of creation. Everything that was created was created in his image. Jesus is supreme in creation. Next part of the verse. All things have been created through him and for him. Kira and Isaac were created by me and Michaela. But were they created for us? It will be nice when they can wash their own dishes and wash my clothes and my dishes and everything else too. But is that why they were created? Is that why God gave them to us? Were they created to get jobs, go to school, further populate the earth with beautiful hints and babies? No, they were created for Jesus by Jesus. That means their primary purpose in life is to know him, discover his will for their lives, and live it out. If that is truly our purpose in life, then how will we ever be satisfied until we are living out his purpose for our lives? Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
Jesus is supreme in creation because he himself sustains it. Jesus held creation together before it was even created. He is still holding everything together. Without him, everything would fall apart. Hebrews 1.3 says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Physicists are still confused as to how atoms hold together. You see, the nucleus of the, a- nucleus of the atom contains positively charged protons, which should repel each other like two positively charged magnets repel each other. But something, some, something mysterious and invisible, even physicists, physicists say that, holds them together. Based on all we know right now about electromagnetic energy, every atom should fall, fly apart, but some invisible force stronger than the electromagnetic force holds it together. Physicists don't know what to call this force, so they simply refer to it as the stronger force. I'm not a physicist, and I'm not going to say that the naked hand of God holds the atom together, even though some physicists actually do speculate that. Maybe God has built something into the atom that overcomes the electromagnetic forces, and we'll figure that out someday. But the point is that some incredibly strong force holds the nucleus of every atom together, even when it looks like they should fly apart. In the same way, Jesus holds all of history and your life together, keeping it from unraveling. He sustains creation, keeping natural forces from unraveling everything. Verses 18 through 20. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his bloodshed on the cross. Jesus is sovereign over the church, just as he is over creation. When we became Christians, we became part of Jesus' body. As members of his body, we are totally dependent upon the head, Jesus, for direction. He should control everything we do. Jesus should be exalted in the church because he is the firstborn of the dead. Again, firstborn doesn't mean he was the first person raised from the dead. We know he wasn't. But he is the prototype for all of us who are born out of death. Jesus chose to enter his own creation, take on a body created and sustained by his own power, die, and then be resurrected. What a wonder. God dying for man. Jesus in my place. Such a plan could only come from the mind of God. You can sum up this passage with three statements. One is, Jesus is first. In verse 15, we see that Jesus was first. He was the firstborn of creation. He is the template by which everything is created. He isn't one of many templates. Jesus is not one of the many beautiful things God created. All things were made through Jesus and by Jesus. He is the creator of everything. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought life to, dar- to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Point two, Jesus went first. Jesus pursued a relationship with us when we weren't even looking for him. He went to a bloody cross where he experienced torture and humiliation and died for us so he could buy us back. He didn't have to suffer and die for us. He could have just wiped us all away and started over, but he didn't. He pursued us. He raced us to the cross that we were doomed to and took our place. Three, we should put Jesus first. Jesus can't be one on a list of priorities. He needs to be our number one priority. Verse 18 says he is first in everything. So scratch what I just said about Jesus needing to be our number one priority. Jesus must be our only priority. If I said to Michaela, sweetheart, on my list of women, you're really important. How do you think she'd react? What if I said, baby, you're at the top of my list of women. She'd take that list and rip it apart and probably rip into me too. She doesn't deserve to be on a list. She is the list. It should be the same with Jesus. We tend to prioritize our lives, our marriages, or the raising of our children when we should be making Jesus our only priority. 
Instead, we should prioritize Jesus in our lives, prioritize Jesus in our marriages, and prioritize Jesus in the raising of our children. If we do that, then all of these things will fall into place. Is Jesus the only priority in your life, or is he one of many priorities? Is he important to you, or is he everything to you? Is Jesus first in your life? What gets your first and best? Jesus should have first place in everything in your life. He should have first place in your heart, first place in your affections. He should be the one you love most, the one you think about the most, and the one you care about the most. What he wants should be the first thing you consider in anything you do. His will should be preeminent in your life. His agenda should rule your life. If Jesus does truly rule your life, it will be evident in three areas. And think about these personally. If Jesus ru rules your life, it will be evident in how you spend your time. Does Jesus get the first and best of your time? Do you spend your time teaching your children how to throw a perfect spiral, cast a line, skin a deer, or how to know and follow Jesus? One of the excuses I heard recently as to why someone wasn't more active with the ministerial association's events was so that he could spend time with his family. That most of the events fall on his only time off when he could spend with his kids. And that, at the surface, seemed like a good excuse. An excuse that we as earthly beings would even consider admirable. But if we choose to do something with family over something involving Jesus, isn't that choosing our family over Jesus? Besides, why not take your kids with you? Deuteronomy gives clear instructions on when you should be teaching your children about God. Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as, a, as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you get, are getting up. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. I don't know if anyone's been over to my house recently, but on my door, because in Deuteronomy 6, I think, what it's saying is to love the Lord your God, or what it says to write on your doorpost is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And that's what's written on our doorpost if you go over to our house. It says to teach your children about God when you're at home and when you're traveling. Teach them when you go to bed and when you get up. Basically, never stop teaching your children about God. And look, there is a promise that goes along with it. It says if you do, that you and your children will flourish as long as the sky is above the earth. Last week, I also talked to someone about being a pastor. The person said that as I become a pastor, because that's what I'm wanting to do with my life, I need to make sure that I set clear boundaries, that if I'm paid for, say, 40 hours of work every week, that I should do my best not to exceed that, that I need to make sure I leave time for myself and for family. Again, I understood what he was saying, but I also have, time, I have to remember Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I am a sinner. The only wage I have earned is death. But God gifted me eternal life through Jesus Christ. So I will do whatever I can to show my appreciation for that gracious gift, even if it means working more than 40 hours a week. If I were to bring someone to Christ in my unpaid overtime, wouldn't that be payment enough? Often in our lives, Christ is marginalized. He often isn't first. Schoolwork, hobbies, or family com commonly take first place. Which of your weekly com commitments gets dropped first when you realize you have too much to do that week? Do you decide not to go to church because you need a day off? Do you decide not to work Awana because you have too much to do? The second area Jesus reign over your life will be evident is in your talents. When you think about your talents and your career, your vocation, does God get priority? I talked about talents when I preached a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to go into talents. But I would like to point out that the word we use for our occupations, our vocation, the re root word of it, voca, is actually means calling. So your job is your calling. Is it really your calling in life? And actually, when work is first mentioned in Genesis, the word is abad, which shares the same root word as worship. 
Adam worshipped God in the garden, not just by spending time with God and staying away from a few bad apples. He worshipped God by doing the work God put him in the garden to do. When you think of your vocation, is it God's calling for you or just a job? Can you use your job to answer God's call on your life? Do you use your job to further his kingdom? Why don't you? Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. If our work is done unto God, it should be done according to the highest standards of excellence, as an offering to God. Why don't we use our positions at work to further Jesus' kingdom? Why do we work only for ourselves? Where would we be if Jesus had leveraged his position entirely for self-benefit? If Jesus had approached his potential and his assets the way that we approach ours? The third area where Jesus should be evident is where you spend your treasures. Your checkbook will tell you, above all others, where your priorities are. If your priority is furthering Christ's kingdom, then you will give your first and best monetarily also. Have you ever wanted a house, car, boat, whatever, but you knew the only way you could achieve it was by lessening other areas of your life? You say to yourself, I can do this, but some things will have to change. I'll go on a diet of nothing but ramen if it means I can achieve my goal. You cause yourself to suffer in other areas just so you can have one thing you want. Has that ever been an issue when it came to giving to God? Have you ever wanted to give money to God so badly that you would lower yourself to eating nothing but ramen to achieve your goal? What we tend to do is give God what we can afford after we have fulfilled, every, fulfilled ourselves in every other way. We give to God after we get the house we want or the car we want, after we achieve the lifestyle we want, after we go to Hawaii again. <laughs> We look at our checkbooks after all these things to see what we can afford to give God. Jesus deserves more than your leftovers. Think about it. Have you ever been to someone's house for dinner and they served you leftovers? Maybe a steak that was reheated in the microwave? That's like the worst possible leftover. If someone did serve you leftovers, you would probably get offended. You'd be insulted. That food was first for someone else and you're just getting their leftovers you are clearly not as important as whoever that meal was originally intended for. Would you ever serve guests for your leftover? Or, yeah, <laughs> serve, your left, serve your guest leftovers. No? Then why would you give God your leftovers? I have personally never been one for tithing or giving a set portion of my income to God every month. But I recently heard a message on tithing that changed my perspective. And since the pastor, the person who gets paid, isn't here, it's fine that I talk about tithing because it's not lining my pocket, so we're good. <laughs> since I heard the message, I start, I've started giving every month. The pastor asked why you didn't tithe. My only real answer was that I sometimes have a hard time making ends meet every month, and I don't want to have to ask my dad for more money because that's embarrassing. So I didn't give because I didn't think I had enough excess to be able to. The pastor then said, if your only reason for not tithing is because you need that money to survive, then you are breaking the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. He said, if, you are to put our full, if we are to put our full faith in God, then that means that we have to rely on God. I lost my place. Where'd it go? You shall... <laughs> If we are to put our full faith in God, then that means we have to rely on him. We must rely on him to supply for all of our needs. So if your reason for not giving is because you rely on your money, then you are making money your God and thus breaking the first commandment. I, I was convicted by this statement. I had been putting my faith in money instead of God. Since then, I've started giving monthly, which forced me to budget better. And now that I'm budgeting better, I actually have more money than I did before, even though I'm giving God a portion of it. However, I do have to confess, when I originally started to give, I started with the concept of tithing, just to get me started. I did the math and I needed to give $286 and some change. So my human brain said, give 250. It's an easier check to write and then you have more left over for yourself. And then after a little bit of time went by, I realized what I was thinking and I became disgusted with what I thought. 
I don't need to put criteria on my giving to lessen it. And $300 is actually an even easier check to write. I'm now trying to give the very most I can. I'm trying to be committed to Christ's kingdom, not just invested in it. God does not want or need your money. God wants all of you, and that includes your money. Jesus spoke about money more than any other subject because he knew that as long as his priority in your life didn't affect your money, then he wasn't the first in your life, and your commitment to him was nothing more than empty words. Honestly, 10% is good enough. But our God isn't a God of good enough. He is a God of all and a God of best. So if your time, talents, and your checkbook doesn't show that you give your best, then it's all a sham. Think about breakfast. When you sit down for a breakfast of bacon and eggs, both the chicken and pig played a part in bringing that breakfast to you. The chicken made a contribution to you, a very generous contribution. But the pig, the pig went all in. The chicken isn't changed by the experience. The pig, however, is transformed by the experience maybe into bacon or ham, you know. I don't want to be a chicken in my giving. I want to be a pig for Jesus. I don't want to give a generous contribution to Jesus. I want to give all of myself so that I can fundamentally, be fundamentally transformed by the experience, by establishing Jesus as the unchallenged priority of my life. Isaiah 53. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root and dry ground, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had, ne and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees that all, all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins." I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Jesus gave up heaven for me, came to earth to live as a man for me. He was despised and rejected for me, even though I turned my back on him. He was despised, but I did not care. Even still, he carried my weakness. My sorrow weighed him down. He was pierced for my rebellion, crushed for my sin. He was beaten. Chunks of flesh were removed from his body so that I could be made whole. Like a sheep, I went astray, but God still laid my sin on him. He was led like a lamb to slaughter and did not say a word because he knew God's plan. He gladly took my place. He died for me and he was resurrected for me. Now he lives inside of me. Jesus made me his priority. How could I not make him mine? God, thank you for helping me get through this today. Thank you for giving me words this, that I could speak for you this week and just help me to continue to make you my priority and continue to help all of us make you our priorities. Just bless us as we go out throughout this week and 
Just love us and cherish us as you always do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.